And that should be all good now. Cool. Thank you, Maina. Um, so let's go ahead. So in Australia, uh, something that we like to do is an acknowledgement of country. So I'll just start off with that. And we acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on which the University of Wollongong is situated. We pay our respects to the Aboriginal elders past and present, who are the knowledge holders and teachers. And we acknowledge their continued spiritual and cultural connection to the country. As we share knowledge, teaching, learning and research within this university, we also pay respect to the knowledge embedded forever within the Aboriginal custodianship of the country. Now, for our colleagues in Brazil, the acknowledgement of country is the standard Australian practice and events, which recognizes the place of Indigenous people as the first custodians of this land. And it promotes awareness of the history and culture of the Indigenous people and formally acknowledges Indigenous people's ongoing connection to the land. And as our network is all about global connections and global collaborations, it is also important for us to share and respect each other's traditions and cultures. And so we would like to also pay our respect to the Indigenous people of the Brazil lands and recognize them as knowledge holders and teachers. Now, just to touch base a little bit about the Women's Research Engineers Network, or REN, as we like to call it, it really came about from the awareness that women in STEM, and, and more importantly, um, women in engineering, there continues to be this underrepresentation and that the gender gap still continues to exist. And so we launched in April of 21, 2021, just this year, not only to connect women, but act as a platform where women will have their voice heard, share knowledge, and create their own opportunities and foster collaborations. Now, it is a bilateral collaboration between Australia, um, well, the University of Wollongong in Australia and the Sakala School of Engineering within the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. And we are partnered with um, University of Sao Paulo or USP's Women's Office. Um, and it goes without saying that REN wouldn't be possible without our support and funding from COLA or COALA, it, which stands for the Council on Amer Australian, sorry, Australian Latin America Relations. Um, and on the right hand side, you can see a few photos of our committee members today. So we're a very diverse group uh, of women as well, which is amazing. And I guess with today's event, why it's why we're talking about feminism really goes back to our vision. Now, vision to achieve gender equity among women and men in engineering fields and to see a greater participation of women in research and engineering roles over longer careers. So just quickly touching base with today's outline, we have four amazing speakers here today with us. We have our opening remarks uh, from Professor Patricia Davidson. She is the Vice Chancellor of the University of Wollongong here in Australia, followed by Professor Vahan Agopia, who is the Professor President uh, at the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. Uh, next up, after that, we have two guest speakers who will be speaking on feminism. Dr. Kwa E. Ling, she is a member representative of the UOW Feminist Research Network, and she's also a senior lecturer in sociology um, here at UOW as well. And then after that, we have Professor Eva Altman Bly. She is the an emeritus professor, emeritus professor, and sociologist at the Faculty of Philosophy, Languages, and Human Sciences at USP. And following that, we will have Q&A um, for the two guest speakers as well. Now, without further ado, um, let me just introduce um, Professor Patricia Davidson, or um, Trish, if that's all right with you. Um, so Trish joined the University of Wollongong in May 2021, just this year as well. And prior to her current role, she was the Dean of the John Hopkins School of Nursing in Baltimore in the United States. She is a global leader in nursing and healthcare and advocacy, focusing on person-centered care delivery and the improvement of cardiovascular health outcomes for women and vulnerable populations. And to celebrate her contributions to the advancement of global health, 
Um, she received the Consortium of the Universities for Global Health Distinguished Leader Award just this year. And in addition to her role as the VC, she also serves as the Council General of the International Council on Women's Health Issues. Um, so without further ado, Trish, why do you think engineers and everyone should care about feminism? Well, so um, I think so much to me, um, feminism speaks to my values and particularly those of diversity, equity and inclusion. So it's phenomenal to see amazing women here today. And more importantly, I think some amazing men who get it. Um, so I'm so glad to see um, some of many of our male colleagues here today. So I think it speaks to a, a different world that is more inclusive, less hierarchical, more equitable, and more attuned to the needs and values of individuals, families, and communities. Oh, yep. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, thank you for that. And yeah, it's so great to hear that, you know, UAW is really, um, you know, striving to work towards gender, gender equality as well. And we are quite committed to reaching, you know, those um, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals as well. Um, I will go ahead and um, quickly introduce Professor Bahan. So, uh, Professor Vahan is the current president of USD and since 2018 in Brazil. He is a professor of materials and components for construction, having completed his undergraduate studies, masters and PhD in civil engineering. His previous roles include USP's provost for graduate studies, um, CEO of the Technological Research Institute of the Sao Paulo State, and Vice President of the International Council for Research and Innovation in Building and Construction. Um, he was, uh, he is also a highly, uh, highly regarded academic and leader, having received the commander of the National Order of Scientific Merit and Honorable Citizen of Sao Paulo City. Um, and Professor Vahan, as I also have asked um, Trish, why do you think engineers and everyone should care about feminism? Well, thanks Emily for that really uh, great question. And um, I think my profession of nursing and engineering are really juxtaposed uh, for the same reasons, because our professions have largely been driven by gender norms and they are socially created. And one of the uh, great um, words of wisdom I've heard from Loetija O'Donoghue, who is a, um, an, a national treasure in Australia and an Aboriginal nurse, she said to me once, Ab socially created problems can be socially, cre socially transformed. So if we look back in history, um, I always uh, remember seeing um, in, in uh, the office of Valerie Linton, the previous executive dean of the faculty, a book that she treasured for the Philippines, a very old engineering textbook where all the illustrations were of women. So originally in the Philippines, women were engineers. Can I tell you, back in century, in the centuries, um, nurses were men until uh, you know, social norms moved um, the notion of, of caring into, uh, in particular, religious orders, and the rest, the rest is history. So I think it's really important that all of our professions reflect the diversity of the um, communities and the, in which we work and serve. I think we need to also think about gender as not a binary outcome, but also think about that many of our roles are socially constructed. And I think also we see the world through different lens and we do have to appreciate each other's uh, discrete um, perspectives. So interestingly, uh, where I came from at Johns Hopkins, the president of the university, uh, Ron Daniels had two um, uh, actually 
key performance indicators for the deans. For Ed Schlesinger, the dean of the School of Engineering, it was 50% of women in, his, in uh, the engineering school. And for me, it was 50% of men. For, for actually in engineering, they were doing really well because of um, the, uh, what's the word? Because the status that comes with STEM. Can I also say, and as a word of caution to all of you wonderful um, young scientists, that, you know, STEM, you know, many of the virtues of uh, other disciplines, you know, particularly <clears throat> caring, et cetera, those are also really powerful constructs. So people talk about soft skills, um, listening, empathy, ability to have relationships, communication. I think they are not soft skills, they're essential skills. So I think, you know, the world is really getting into an amazing place if particularly um, engineering disciplines can role model the importance of gender representation, inclusivity and diversity. Thank you for that, Patricia. And it's really great to hear that, um, you know, even just the understanding that that the social construct is not just black and white as well. It's really a, a very long gray spectrum in that sense. Um, so I will um, ask Professor Vahan as well, um, you know, why, why do you think engineers and, and everyone should also care about feminism? Hi, thank you, Emily. It's a great pleasure to, just to greet everyone, all of the participants. Uh, and to, to congratulate with you, with all of the organizers for this event, because really is a very important point. Uh, and I'd like to ask, actually to, to greet uh, Professor Patricia Davidson, because as you know, uh, the links between University of Sao Paulo and University of Oolong is very, are very strong. We, we are a member of a University Global Partnership Network, together with the uh, Surrey University at UK and uh, North Carolina in USA. So we, we work together, we have a lot of work going on. Uh, the topic uh, is really very important because uh, as you mentioned, Emily, that, I, that I'm an engineer, I was the dean of the engineering school named Escola Politecnica. And and when I was the dean, for the first time, I have the honor to, to give the position of full professor, a female professor. After 110 years, for the first time, it's called Polytechnic, I had the first female professor. And now, as a pre president of University of Sao Paulo, it was a great pleasure for me to inaugurate the first female dean of engineering school after 120 years of it. Amazing. As a professional, let's say, when I was a student in early 70s, my female colleagues were not allowed to, to visit tunnel construction sites. It's amazing, but it's true. Uh, 15 years later, in a very large tunnel, road tunnel, a female engineer was the first time the head site engineer. So the things uh, has changed a lot. But uh, I, I have to point out that sometimes uh, the changes are going faster. Sometimes the speed is very slow. And so we have a lot of things to be done. So we still have in a developing country like Brazil, a lot of prejudice for female professionals, mainly in the industrial, industrial plants and construction sites. And also, of course, in the management positions. So really, we have a lot of work to be done. And so initiatives like this one that we discuss a little bit, that we put uh, that in front of us the problem, it's very important. Uh, and, and I'm very glad that the uh, University of Sao Paulo is, um, has joined the United Nations Women uh, 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 Initiatives. Uh, and I'm sure that 
this was very important for us to widespread these ideas among our faculties, among our, our students and our professionals. Let's see, let's hope that the things, the, the speed of change will increase. Thanks, uh, a work like this. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vahan, uh, Professor Vahan. Um, I okay, do it's have... Vahan, no, don't worry. Vahan? Don't worry, Emily. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I do have one sneaky question before I let the both of you resume your, your very busy schedules. Um, and well, I guess in the sense that, you know, Trish, you sort of um, touched a little bit on, you know, key performance indicators uh, that, you know, um, I guess executives, leaders within the universities have to sort of meet in order to get the university, um, you know, to, to have that sense of progression as well. Um, and I, I guess in a sense, um, similar for you, uh, Professor Vahan, in the sense that, um, you know, it, we do have to also celebrate the successes of, of placing and um, uh, women in, in higher positions and, and, and obtaining full professorship as well. Um, and those two things are so important, but in a sense, how do we, how can we transform um, these KPI or these metrics into a much more meaningful sense as well. So rather than just in the sense of ticking boxes, you know, how can we make sure that what the, the people that we promote and the people that we take on actually really contribute and make a difference in, in the world that we see or will see? So, please go ahead. Please, please, please. Sorry, Patricia. It's, it's no, 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 no. Um, you know, I think what we need to move from the notion of, you know, equality to equity. So often equality just means you're doing the same things to everybody. We have to move to a stance of equity. That is that you're targeting particular populations. Um, you know, one size fits all doesn't work. Um, we have to think about uh, different ways to be inclusive. And as Professor Bahan has said, you can get women there, but if they're not valued and engaged and respected in the workplace, it's not going to work. So this needs collaboration with industry and also, um, you know, great activities like the REN network of doing are uh, engaging leadership, having the conversation and challenging norms and stereotypes. And probably Professor Bahan and I are of a similar age. And I think be encouraged that things can change in a lifetime. Can I tell you, when I first started at Wollongong in the 70s, as a nurse, I had to scrub the surgeon's boots. And now I'm back as vice chancellor. So, um, so things, so be encouraged, be motivated. In a generation, in a, in a working life, things can change. And things can change because of, the work that people like you do um, in terms of challenging norms and assumptions. So over to you, Professor Vahan. Okay, thank you. Uh, but the, the, an easy, easy answer is to, to say the statement of United Nations. We can cope with this problem if we, the male, uh, becomes, become feminist. So we must be feminists also to cope. Uh, but I think that uh, we need, and I, I agree with Patricia that the things are changing in one generation, but we, we have to go more uh, in a higher speed. And so for, to go in higher speed, we need to have some proactive uh, measures. Uh, that's why uh, uh, Professor Maria Arminda is helping me to, for let's say, to define some act actions, as also Eva Bly used to do in the past. She helped me with the, in the past. So uh, we need to have to go with a proactive measures and uh, be, be sure that uh, we have to change the, the behavior we, we use in the society, which is not very easy. Yeah, I definitely agree with the both of you. You know, it takes such a long time to to 
um, to see those changes, but I guess in a sense as well, it's just about changing that kind of habitual um, tendencies that we have um, and that, that social construct, I suppose. Um, and, and I guess touching on that, uh, it, we, we will let you to um, you know, resume your very busy schedules, um, but feel free to stay on. Um, and we will move on to the next section. So it's really lovely to hear from the both of you and to hear your, your insights and your opinions as well and, and, and to, I guess, inspire and motivate us to continue striving for this sense of gender equality as well and gender equity in a sense. Um, before we let you two go, we will take a quick uh, group photo um, before I forget again. <laughs> Um, so I believe so if you are happy, you can turn on your cameras so for the for the photo. Um, and so I in three, two, one, cheese. Excellent. And I have a beautiful photo of us. Excellent. Thank you so much again, uh, Professor Patricia and Professor Vaham for your time. Um, and yeah, uh, all the best. Take care. Uh, in well, time I'm luckily, I'm lucky, Emily. I can stay for for. A oh, listen. excellent, excellent. Yeah, no, it's great to hear. Okay, so I will share my screen again. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now for the next section, uh, we are going to be accepting questions. So if you do have any questions, um, you can either pop them in the chat or um, closer towards the end of the, um, of the session, if you are comfortable with um, you know, opening up your cameras and opening up your mics, you are welcome to raise your hand as well. Um, so first up, I would like to introduce Dr. Kwa E. Ling, and she will be presenting on the Fire Dragon Feminist Superpowers of a Queer Ethnic Minority Migrant Woman Working in Australia. And the title really, you know, fills, fills my belly already. Um, she is a member of the UW Feminist Research Network. She is also a senior lecturer in sociology from the Faculty of Arts, Social Sciences and Humanities at UOW. And she calls herself a fire dragon feminist, which I'm sure we will hear a lot about. Um, after receiving her PhD in sociology at the University of Sydney, she went on to do her postdoctoral and research fellowships at the National University of Singapore um, before returning to Wollongong. And her research uh, focus, focuses on decolonial, transnational and intersectional feminist perspectives and centers around community-based research, inequalities, and social justice. And she, you know, as every other researcher does, um, they, uh, you know, they have published several articles. But she also has published two books. One of them I've put the title in there: Transnational Divorce, Understanding Intimacies and Inequalities from Singapore, and that was published in 2020. Um, so let me just stop sharing my screen. Um, and so I suppose, Eling, I'll ask you the same question as I have for Trish and Bahan. You know, why, why do you think from, from a, so a sociologist's perspective, why do you think it's so important for engineers and, and everyone to care about uh, feminism? Um, all right. Hi, everyone. Um, you, can you hear me well? Yes, we can. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so hi everyone. My name is Yiling. Uh, my surname is Kwa and given name Yiling. Um, I would like to first acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation as the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which I'm located. And the land was never ceded and remained occupied. I wish to acknowledge my privilege and complicity as a migrant living and working in a settler colonial system that continues to perpetuate injustices and inequalities against First Nation populations. I would like to pay my respect to the elders past, present and future for they hold the memories, the culture and hopes of Indigenous Australia. I would also like to extend my respect to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are present here to, with us today. So Emily, you asked me a question, why should we all care about feminism? 
Well, I particularly identify with uh, this definition of feminism uh, that was provided by um, Sarah Ahmed. Um, so Sarah Ahmed is, is an internationally known UK-based, Australia-born feminist writer. She was born in Adelaide, in fact. Um, so we were, EWW was really lucky to host her in 2018, and she came uh, for our Feminist Research Network lecture um, and, and to talk about her book, uh, Living a Feminist Life. So this particular definition really uh, um, left a, a very deep impression of what it means to be a feminist and what does uh, feminism uh, mean. Um, so this quote, um, I will just read very quickly, living a feminist life does not mean adopting a set of ideas or norms of conduct, although it might mean asking ethical questions about how to live better in an unjust and unequal world how to create relationships with others that are more equal, how to find ways to support those who are not supported or less supported by social systems, how to keep coming up against histories that become concrete, histories that become as solid as wars. Now, Sarah Ahmed's take on the definition of feminism um, is something they have adopted over the last few years, uh, because what she has explained is that feminism is definitely beyond just fighting for women's rights and exposed subjugation of women. Feminism is not just about um, US and UK white women first and second wave movements. But please do not get me wrong, um, abolishing patriarchy and calling out toxic masculinity, misogyny is of great importance and urgency. But what she has highlighted in her definition is that other systems of domination, such as colonialism, neoliberalism, heterosexism, racism, and queer phobia also oppress many less powerful and resource people. And that is key here. So this broad definition of feminism really gives us a reason why we should all care about feminism, because we all wish to have a good life and we all wish to have a better world. And to achieve that, we need to care for our human beings and our non-human connection community as well, so that we can all thrive and flourish together. And by recognizing and exposing and confronting in inequalities and injustices in histories and our current societies, we, are, we could all then come together to think of ways to create more equal relationships with others who are not supported or less supported by social systems. So to me, feminism are the driving forces uh, to bring about a better world for all oppressed and those who have been treated less equally. And I think because of this broad definition, all of us can be feminists and all of us should be feminists. So I'll just go on with um, my um, presentation. So this, the title of this, uh, this uh, my, my presentation is around fire dragon feminism. Um, so I'm here to share about my own uh, theoretical strand and my own brand of feminism, which I launched last year. Um, I'm not here to speak on behalf of white Australian families, indigenous Australian families, and other women of color families, because we all know that um, different groups of women or different groups of people, different groups of marginalized populations will have different concerns. For example, while white middle class Australian women are mainly concerned with the 14% gender wage gap in Australia, the glass ceiling, the, um, and they're concerned for fighting for family friendly work conditions, they're also concerned with uh, the high rates of domestic violence um, in, in Australia. On average, one Australian, woman, uh, one Australian woman every week die from murder by their current or former partner. So that's the concern of white uh, middle-class Australian women. But on the other hand, First Nation women in Australia will be more concerned with sovereignty, land rights, decolonization, anti-racism, self-determination, anti-violence. So the, and the physical, sexual, emotional, and financial violence against First Nation women is not just um, exacted by indigenous and non-indigenous men, but also by the state. So these are their concerns, and these are the, um, the causes that they, they fight for in, in, their, in the indigenous um, Australian women movement, feminist movement. So that is why we have uh, feminisms in plural form, and, and I was really pleased to see in the title of this event, uh, because feminism, as we can see, is employed to conceptualize concerns of different groups of people, different groups of women, and they organize appropriate and relevant strategy, resistance strategies. So I'm really pleased um, to see that title, and, um, and, and that makes us think of uh, other groups of concern, for example, uh, Black feminist movement, Chicana feminist, Indigenous feminist, queer feminists, 
um, environmental feminists, cultural feminists, so on and so forth. So today I speak from my position as a Singapore-born queer ethnic minority migrant woman living and working in predominantly white Australian society for the past decade. So what is Fire Dragon Feminism? Um, it is a place-based feminist perspective and methodology that guides my life, research, teaching, and community work. So feminism, um, to, to begin with, for me, it's not just a movement, it's not just a women's movement, but it can mean that. It can also mean activism movement. It can mean theoretical strengths, but for me, it is a life methodology. It's a methodology that guides my research, my teaching, my community work, and as well as the way I connect with others. So it's a guiding principle, it's a life skill, it's also a survivor and, and resistant tool. So fire, fire Dragon Feminism in particular reflects the specificity of my ontological and epistemological positions. So as a feminist researcher inspired by powerful women of colour, feminist writers such as Angela Davies that you all know, Audre Lorde, Bell Hooks, Maxine Hong Kingston, Gloria Anzandua, uh, Sarah Ahmed, Eileen Moriton Robinson, and Sadia Hartman. These are all wonderful uh, women who have taught me as I read their work. I'm both deeply connected with them, but also strangely alienated by their writing. Their historical, cultural, and political specificity gave birth to their particular feminist um, philosophies that they upheld, and also the resistance strategies they developed. And to articulate my own brand of feminism, my own feminist manifesto and my own feminist survivor toolkit that reflects and expresses and responds to my specific and shifting uh, complex realities, I dug deep into my own cultural roots and reflected upon my upbringing. I was born in Singapore. Um, I, um, uh, Chinese mythology, uh, Southeast Asian heritage, post-colonial Singaporean context, multicultural influences from my Singaporean Chinese, Indonesian Peranakan, Taoist ancestor worship cultural heritage, as well as multilingual where uh, we speak English as our first language, but we also speak Mandarin, Hokkien as a Chinese dialect. And I speak Bahasa Indonesian because my maternal grandmother is, is Indonesian. So with that kind of multilingual background as well, all this play a significant role in shaping who I am and helping me to conceptualize fire dragon feminism. And growing up, I was surrounded by strong women like my maternal grandmother, my mother, my godmother, who all role modeled um, how, what living in poverty and hardship and through war, migration and violence was like. They showed me what family strength, women's independence and interdependence, um, as well as connectedness and the fight against patriarchy was all about. They may not have the words, they may not know what feminism is, but they had the feminist actions and power which taught me so much. So born in 1976, my Chinese zodiac sign is dragon and my element is fire. So there are five elements uh, according to Chinese mythology and I'm fire and my zodiac sign is dragon. There are 12 Chinese horoscopes. Growing up as a Singaporean Chinese, I'm acutely aware of my destiny as a fire dragon. In Chinese mythology, the dragon has been referred to the god of clouds and rain, and also the king of seas. The combination of Chinese zodiac sign of dragon and the element of fire is believed to ordain one with the luckiest, most auspicious, most powerful, most successful, and formidable destiny. So claiming the supernatural powers of a dragon as the god of clouds and rain, and the king of seas, and assuming the most powerful position of a fire dragon. I conceptualize fire dragon feminism and define what it meant to be a fire dragon feminist. Like the god of clouds and rain, a fire dragon feminist, feminist hold a global, macro, and broad view of the world's affairs. And like the king of seas, a fire dragon feminist develop an acute sensitivity towards changing types, movements, processes, dynamics and patterns. I call these abilities my superpowers. I have an ever expanding arsenal of fire dragon family superpowers and will keep collecting and adding more superpowers in my arsenal as I live and learn through different and difficult life situations. I call upon these superpowers to help me fulfill my family's missions and I reckon by the time I reach an old age of 80, my arsenal will be full and I will have the superpowers of a fire dragon feminist elder. 
So what are the superpowers in my fire dragon feminist arsenal now? Now, my disciplinary position as a trained sociologist motivates me to take on a macro, miso, micro approach to make sense of relationship between self and society, individual life experiences and broader structures, private domains and public life. I regard this research capability as a valuable superpower of a fire dragon feminist. The dragon being regarded as the god of clouds and, and rain has this broad view of what is happening in the world and the king of seas being very sensitive to how the movement of clouds and rain could change the tides and the movement of seas could in turn impact the ecosystem, local human and non-human communities and in individual lives. Summoning the superpowers of fire dragon, a fire dragon feminist would then have the ability to understand the social world using this approach, this analytical approach, and join the dots to explain the interconnectedness of social processes and the effects of social transformation in societies. Now, while this research direction has proven to be extremely useful in unpacking power relations, I also subscribe to specific feminist tools such as transnational, intersectional, and decolonial feminist perspectives to near down the root causes and to investigate into inside stories and shed light on oftentimes neglected and willfully ignored issues concerning social inequalities and injustices. For example, using a transnational feminist perspective, I seek to understand how global structure um, such as um, capitalism, neoliberalism, global hierarchy of nations, global patriarchy, global gender order, transnational processes, and national governance framework can all create hegemonies and inequalities. Now, another superpower that has been proven to be really critical is feminist rage. Now, Audrey Lord help us to gain clarity of the feminist and constructive value of anger by instructing us that anger is loaded with information and energy. Instead of perceiving anger as a negative emotion that requires taming and management, a fire dragon feminist transform rage into fuel that boosts her energy and tenacity to blow flames at inequalities and injustices. To be able to use this rage, the constructive causes uh, for, sorry, to, use, to be able to use this rage for constructive causes and generative missions, I need to also possess another uh, superpower, which is queer pessimism. Queer pessimism is an obstinate refusal to be optimistic about the right happy objects like wealth accumulation, property acquisition, property development, and, and exploitation of our minerals and resources, and as well as social structures like heteronormativity. All these are at the expense, all these are expanded at the expense of those who have less access to, to these happy objects. So I refuse to be content with the unequal distribution of life chances. I refuse to be optimistic about things will get better for minorities by continuing the way that the white majority expect us or expect me to behave, the compliant, harmonious, grateful, and hardworking Asian migrant woman. I refuse to be content with tokenistic consolation and empty promises that the right things are set in motion when there's no real action to radically topple unequal power relations between the white majority and indigenous and ethnic minority populations. So these are all my superpowers currently in my arsenal. And as I mentioned earlier, I will keep collecting superpowers as I learn and go through difficult and different uh, situations in life. So what are my missions? So based on my location as an ethnic minority person in Australia now, I'm mostly concerned with different forms of um, racism, including, um, on, including um, ongoing state violence and neglect of First Nation Australian populations, institutional and everyday racism manifesting in different segments of the society, the search of anti-Asian, anti-Chinese uh, racism due to COVID-19 pandemic, and also persistent Islamophobia. There have been plenty of evidence, life experiences, and real life accounts of overt and casual racism, but oftentimes these stories fell to deaf ears, colorblind eyes, black holes, and white walls. I am also deeply concerned with how racism is enmeshed with other forms of oppressions, such as white patriarchy, heterosexism, xenophobia, and queerphobia. With these concerns in mind, these are my, the missions that, um, that I 
I set out to do, whether it is research, teaching, community engagement, and social connections. Using my Fire Dragon family superpowers of feminist rage, queer pessimism, intersectional transnational feminist perspectives, and sociological training, I seek to first expose empirical blind spots, unequal power relations, and structural privileges. And after exposing the problem, I, I seek to blow flames as a Fire Dragon feminist at oppressions, inequalities, and injustices. But it's not just about dismantling uh, power structures and destroying uh, injustices. It is also about reimagining more equal and more just futures for everyone. And to do that, we need to rebuild communities for resistance and social justice. So whether you are an engineer, a university management executive, or a sociologist like me, we could all take up these missions to, for a more equitable and fairer world where life chances, hopes, resources, and wealth are more justly and evenly distributed. Now, taking on this less popular route to go against the powerful tides of white dominance, patriarchy, and heteronormativity, I'm unsure about how my futures may turn out to be, since I will be and have been met with white walls blocking my pathways, white noise cluttering my mind, and white powers injuring my bodies and spirits. However, being driven by feminist rage and queer pessimism for the pursuit of a more equal and just distribution of life chances and hopes, I will keep doing my thing as a fire dragon feminist to keep showing up, speak up, blow flames, lead, redirect, and rebuild. That's it. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, um, Eileen, for that lovely presentation. I have to say, you know, I've definitely learned a lot of things and, and I really, I really enjoyed how you used the, um, you know, that, that fire dragon feminist concept as well. And it, in a way, it's so unique, but it, it also, it also resonates with other, other cultures as well. I will, yep, I will move on to introduce um, our next here we are. So we have Professor Eva Altman Bly. She is a sociologist and emeritus professor at the Faculty of Philosophy, Languages and Human Sciences at USD. And her research focuses on social gender relations and she's published um, multiple books and articles uh, on topics such as uh, urban issues, workers' housing, women's political participation, violence against women, feminism, masculinities, and, and Jewish immigration. And I've popped in a title uh, of one of her books, and I believe in English, it is 50 Years of Feminism in Argentina, Brazil, and Chile. She was actually the first to introduce the studies and research on women at USP, uh, the first uh, president of the State Council of the Female Condition of the State of Sao Paulo. Um, as she was also a senator of the Republic of Brazil, coordinated the USP Women's Office from 2016 to 2019. And I believe that was before Professor Maria Aminda as well. Um, and she is just this year was, was um, awarded the Florestan Fernandes Award from the Brazilian Society of Sociology. Um, so very, um, it's a great pleasure to have her here today. Um, and for her presentation, she's actually um, given us a recording. Dear colleagues from the University of Dolelong, it's a pleasure to be with you. We live in so different sides of the planet. Brazil is in South America, Australia in the Oceania, we are surrounded by the Atlantic Ocean, by the Indi you, by the Indian and Pacific Ocean. We were colonized by several empires. We speak different languages. We have different cultures, different power hierarchies, different ways of domination, subordination, ethnic differentiations. However, we are going through a similar issue an anti-gendered policy. To understand the present, let's take a quick look 
back at the Brazilian redemocratization after 1964-1985 dictatorship period. In 1988, we created a new constitution, the Citizen Constitution, to which the women send a letter in which they gather the demands discussed and collected for four years throughout the country. In summary, we can say that from 1988 onwards, Brazilian women achieved political citizenship. This is enormous. This means that men and women are equal in rights and obligations. Women can recognize the paternity of their children regardless of the father's presence. Can you imagine if the man, man was in prison or, or disappeared, she couldn't uh, just recognize her own child, but now she can, even if he, the father is not present. Women have the right to work and to spend their money regardless of their husband's permission. Women have the guarantee of labor rights, such as unemployment insurance, vacation bonus, 44-hour work week, right to strike and train union freedom. Strikes and claims were before treated as police cases, marking the maintenance of a slavery mentality so it's now uh, really a new mentality. We started to have freedom of speech and the end of censorship in media, films, plays and music, etc. And in the health field, one of the most important uh, institute, the SUS, Unified Healthcare System was created. A milestone in indigenous rights began to be discussed with the demarcation of indigenous lands and the protection of the environment. Black women's entities and leaders with a broad political trajectory highlighted the need to include topics such as the condition of incarcerated women and trafficking of women. So, this framework of social and political rights describes advances in a democratic country. I stress the idea of democracy. But, as we know in societies, changes are dynamic. There are advances, but also setbacks. Especially on the topic of gender issues, it is necessary to be always alert as there are conflicts of interest and traditional values resist. Just look what is happening now, nowadays in Afghanistan and Turkey, how they are going back. They had the democracy and now everything finished. In the second half of the 20th and 21st century, Brazil has gone through profound structural changes, broad urbanization, modernization, reduction of population, rural population and rural work, tertiary growth, advanced technology, development of science, expansion of higher education, there were profound changes in the economic uh, structure and diversification of social classes. They were, social classes was expanded, but without, this is important, a reduction in poverty. So there are a lot of changes, but poverty maintained, marginality maintained, and above all, the inclusion of black population, rural migrants, they were not included in the new society. We have gone through economic crisis, ups and downs, and political struggles for power. So, 
modernization can be described as erratic, unstable. Neoliberalism marked society by deepening inequalities. Social protection institutes were not created. Economic differences have deepened racism even further. Black women were, and still are, the base of the social pyramid. They performed manual functions and often performed tasks considered unproductive, associated to the care economy, such as domestic workers and caregivers. At the same time, the formation of intellectual boards and political activism of black women associated with feminism grew. So, you see, there are a lot of changes going forward or going back, or changes are not very, very uh, stable. On the contrary, they are unstable. Over the last two decades, there has been deindustrialization and urban unemployment has increased. Population segments were expelled in the process of gentrification. Urban planning prioritized the large buildings in which most companies were involved in corruption. Violence increased, policing became inadequate, and militia expanded. Brazilian society that was predominantly Catholic saw the expansion of radical evangelicals. This, the, the, the problem of religion is absolutely fundamental in the Brazilian society. From the point of view of sexual and the reproductive rights, both religions, Catholic and evangelicals, both strengths are similar. They have conservative orientations, they are against abortion, fight for the right for the unborn child, and are against sex education. That's incredible. How to understand then that a society with a new liberal economy elects a government that adopts a conservative policy of customs and is against science, against women, against social gender relations. Well, families, on the contrary, families are increasingly reorganizing around women and women and their children. Women currently had almost 40% of families. Paradoxically, this family constellation was not enough to distinguish patriarchy. On the contrary, male economic destabilization is possibly responsible for the extraordinary number of femicides. Research shows that it's acceptable for women to work, but there are much more valued when they take care of children and house. You see, the past is maintained. The contradiction between conservatism of customs and the modernization of means of communication was extensively manipulated for political purposes. The federal government's sexual education for young people and adolescents program was demonized by conservative politicians. The current President of the Republic, in his electoral campaign, spread through fake news, so using very modern means of communication, that the sexual education program in schools aimed to sexualize children, addict them. Although untrue, it's really, it's not untrue. It eroded the proposal that ended up being withdrawn from government plans and disqualified the opposition candidates. So, if they, they just talk against sexual education, demonizing them, 
it was impossible to maintain and the gender agenda entered at the same line. It became to be qualified as communist propaganda. Therefore, to exclude a gender agenda, the federal government and its supporters proposed to create a non-party school. Needless to explain, the contradiction of a non-party school precisely because it includes a particular school, a particular party school. At the moment, the country is experiencing the destruction of gender policy. The term gender was banned by the federal government, by the Ministry of Education. It was removed from school books. While in the civilized world, science woke up precisely to include in its research gender dimension, researching what's going on with male and female. Here, we have returned to the medieval period. Several ministers supported the president in its anti-gender campaign. The picture is complete when we analyze the actions of the Ministry of Women, Family and Human Rights, which leads, she leads the policy of war against gender. Several ministers supported the president in its anti-gender campaign. The picture is complete when we analyze the actions of the Ministry of Women, Family and Human Rights, which leads the policy of war against gender. The authoritarian framework described here has stimulated intense reactions that aim to stop the erosion of democracy. So we are living a, a big contradiction among the different forces of democracy. In universities and scientific organizations, there are intense manifestations. My critical pronouncement on the erasure of gender issue is only possible because I work at a university that is open to various forms of knowledge and does not censor or impede innovative aspects. Social movements are relatively clouded, but political parties have resumed the old protesting evolution. As we live in a presidential regime, large public demonstrations are linked to electoral periods. Reactions to emerge, reactions to fascist movements of the current government are beginning to emerge and survey data have shown that the most intense reactions are coming from the female population. Data shows it clearly. Every day we need to remind society that we are people with human rights. They have already confused us with beings endowed only with a womb, destined for procreation, destinies determined by a body without intelligence, devoid of its own will, subservient to another being. Even today, it's supposed that the women are a homogeneous group, at best a working mass. Feminism came to act in historically constructed concepts and had to deconstruct ideologies that dehumanize women in general and in particular black women, indigenous women, poor migrant women. Multiple feminist movements, groups of women from all social classes became aware and organized themselves all around Brazil, forming networks long before the internet. Feminist struggles stimulated demands for equal social rights beyond women, black women, LGBTs, 
and other marginalized social groups. The history of this is to conclude, I have to say that the history of feminist movements teach us that we need to be on constant alert. We have come a long way, but the risks of a return are in the way. Achievements are not definitive. Uh, they last if there, if there is not a constant alert. We must be alert or we, we, uh, there is a possibility of going back. But we will struggle and we will not, well, we will keep working and we will keep alert to reconstruct democracy and to put out and to, to get again democracy. And thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Professor Eva, for that wonderful presentation. Um, I, 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 you know, in preparation for this event, I, I did watch it beforehand, but I still, still don't, you know, your presentation really resonated. Um, you know, it, not just issues in Brazil, but it really was a, a global, a, a global issue as well. Um, and before we move on to the Q and A session. Uh, the REN network has actually found two amazing documentaries that you may like to view in your own time. Um, we have one Australian documentary and one from Latin America. So the Australian documentary is titled Brazen Hussies. It's a 2020 documentary recording the history of the women's liberation movement in Australia from 1965 to 1975. And it was a chapter in time of when women banded together to defy status quo, demand equality, and create a profound social change, leading to one of the greatest social movements of the 20th century. And the Latin American documentary in English is translated to Gender Under Attack, and it was released by the Latin American Campaign Against Unsafe Abortion. And it portrays the way in which attacks against a twisted concept of gender ideology in four countries are being used to gain political power by right-wing conservative politicians supported by conservatives in the Catholic and Evangelic churches. So it really builds on what uh, Professor Eva was talking about as well. Um, and the four countries are Costa Rica, Peru, Colombia, and Brazil. Now, for the Brazen Hussies documentary, uh, it's not available for download, but we have popped it into a Google Drive link. Um, and one of my colleagues will share that in the chat for, for um, everyone. And you can stream it via Google Drive as well. For the uh, for Gender Under Attack, it is available on YouTube and we have two versions. Well, we found two versions, one in Portuguese and one in English. And I highly recommend to watch these two documentaries as well. And it's so, so important to keep this narrative and this, um, uh, this movement um, being continuously retold as well. Uh, and, and in a sense, like when I was watching it, it definitely opened my eyes to, to how different the, like the same, well, it's the same feminist issue, but it's viewed so differently in different parts of the world. So let's move on to the Q&A session. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, it, we do have, a. I can see a, quite a few questions in the chat already, so I'll get through those first. Uh, but if you are comfortable with um, opening up your camera and opening up your, <laughs> and, and raising your, opening up your mic, you can raise your hand and I'll pick a few names and, and I'll request that you um, open up your mic. So I'll stop sharing my screen first and I'll ask a few questions. So um, we have for, for Ealing, uh, we have a question from Grace and she thanks you for uh, sharing your, your passion about the whole fire dragon feminist movement. And she was wondering how can we all ignite our own superpowers 
identifying and calling out inequality is essential, but it is also challenging to speak up against social norms. And what do you think is a good way to start stepping up and speaking out? And I guess this question, you know, uh, Professor Ava, if you're, you know, if you have a response to that, you're welcome to also um, answer. Uh, thank you, Ewing. Um, yeah, Emily. Um... I just want to make sure that um, uh, Professor Eva will have time for her question. So maybe I'll ask yep. answer first three questions if it's okay. Yes, yes. Um, I, I already read the question, so um, just, just to save your time. <laughs> um, okay, so thanks, uh, Grace, for the, the question. So uh, what's a good way to, um, to call out your own superpowers and, and to speak up? Um, um, how, how do you ignite your own superpowers? I think that the um, one of it is to first uh, reflect, um, sorry, was that the first question? Yes. Yeah, yeah okay. I, I think that um, the first thing is uh, to ignite your own superpowers. I think that to, to you will have, to, I, I'm, personally, I will reflect on my own privileges, <laughs> powers and resources. And um, so that was the journey I took uh, for a whole year to, uh, to do, do, do that on my own, to reflect on my own cultural upbringing and the, also the cultural resources that I didn't know that I have since I was young, uh, growing up, you know, being taught by uh, powerful women in my life and, and through reading as well um, and educating on my own and learning from different resources. So the reflection of privileges, power, resources that you already have, um, that is, is within you that you can call them out, I feel. Um, and also look, uh, reflecting on your own locations and, and positionality, how do you tap on resources and networks um, of allies that you can, you know, uh, work together to, uh, to start doing that work. And what's a good way to start speaking out? I think that um, this is a question that my students ask me all the time. Um, and, and I always tell them, don't feel overwhelmed and because as sociologists, we always tell them these are all the horrible big problems in, in, in the world. And then at the end of the lesson, you'll feel like, oh no, what am I gonna do? You know, it's, it's just like going to be the end of the world. And I feel so overwhelmed that I can't do anything. But I always tell them to start within your own sphere of influence. Uh, think about your work area, you know, what kind of work do you do, uh, the colleagues you come in, um, in contact with, the clients that you serve, or the people you, um, um, you see in your workplace, um, and then work at, at home within the personal sphere, conversations, dinner conversations at home, um, so these are all within your sphere of influence that you can change conversations, you can um, have discussions over these things, you can start changing um, ideas and norms, starting within your own um, sphere of influence. Um, there are also a lot of local organizations that you can join, local um, activism groups that you can join. Within our work um, area, there's also uh, different kind of committees that you can um, uh, join to, you know, to uh, fight for social justice or to uh, fight for equity. So these are things that I feel that can, you can do baby steps, but um, I think within your own safety level, within your comfort level, um, I always tell my students, don't get into trouble with the law. <laughs> don't think that you're just going to go out and do anything. Uh, you should still protect yourself. And, and also knowing when do you stop so that you can exercise self-care and preserve your own very, very precious resources. So that's one question. Another question I know that is, there's a question about how do you expose empirical blind spots? Um, uh, through research, because I'm a sociologist, a feminist sociology, um, I, I do qualitative, quantitative mixed method research to expose uh, what are the empirical blind spots in the main discourse? So what are the popular discourses? What are people saying? What are the social norms? But, and then asking myself important questions. So you do research, you educate yourself, you ask very important questions. Who is benefiting from this current status quo or current power relations? Who holds the power and privilege? Who is um, hoarding the power and privilege? Who is not being supported here and who is being exploited? So I ask difficult questions, uncomfortable questions to expose empirical blind spots um, and to challenge the taken for granted the assumptions. So that's one of the techniques that I always ask students to, to use is that you look at the familiar, you turn them into unfamiliar, and then you ask what are the underlying rules, you know, what are the power relations uh, beneath that social phenomenon and, and how are those power relations being organized? So those are the three questions I picked out. So I, I think I should give uh, time to <laughs> Professor Eva to answer her questions as well. Yeah, thank you so much, Eileen. And I really like the, the tips as well that you gave us because, um, you know, at the end of the day, even though we're just, well, I guess, majority of the people in attendance today are engineers, we are still people in living in a society as well. Uh, yep, so I will ask a few questions to uh, Professor Eva. 
Um, so we have one from Tamara, uh, and she would like to ask uh, how the pandemic is affecting women's equality and progress uh, throughout the regions in, in Brazil, uh, Professor Eva. Oops, sorry, I'll just unmute you very quickly or ask you to unmute. So. Okay. Yep. Can you hear me? Yep, excellent. Okay. Uh, for Tamara, she's, uh, she's in Canada. She's not in Brazil. And I'm okay. happy that she's hearing us. Well, um, you see, it's interesting what's going on here because we live in different moments of uh, feminism. What Quan uh, uh, said, Quan, is it uh, correct to say Quan? My colleague, Quan um, E Ling. Oh, my, my name is Yiling. Yiling. E Ling. Yes. Okay. So, yeah. what Quan is e my surname? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> what E Ling said, it was very inspiring, but it was something we did some years ago. I'm older than you, and we lived feminism in a different uh, moment. So some uh, aspects you are looking for to succeed, we did, we could do it, but what's going on is that we are going back for political reasons, as I, I tried to explain. For example, now uh, there is another question here about the, uh, economic support for research. You see, in the state of Sao Paulo, we can get a lot of support, but from the federal government, no one can get any money for for uh, feminism or any kind of gender research because they are against. So they closed money. They closed every kind of economic support. Uh, the, this is uh, something very, very uh, uh, important because we cannot um, keep going on with our research as we had done on the, in the past. For example, about, uh, about uh, uh, criminal work or about uh, uh, murders of women. Now we have a lot of, it's the feminist, feminist side is very, very high and we cannot do anything really to stop it because, because we cannot uh, have data about the criminals, about uh, what's going on in police. So how can you do research if you cannot get data? I'm not sure if you understand what I, I'm meaning. Uh, so, What's going uh, when uh, Eling said uh, we have to have some points? Okay, uh, uh, we agree with it, but it's impossible to do it. It's impossible even to think in a dragon there. In Brazil, we cannot talk about dragon. Yeah. It's it's more than forbidden. It's something. It's criminal. It's uh, against religions. It's, uh, well, it's not uh, the way we can work. We have to work in different ways. And we can do, we do it. But it's a political uh, problem that uh, we, we are trying to, as I said, to get back uh, democracy because as a feminist, I cannot be a feminist in a society that is not democratic. Yeah, that was actually really excellent. Um, Professor Eva, really well explained. Um, I am going, we do have a quite a number of questions. So um, I'll try and 
combine a few of them together. And this question is um, for Professor Eva, but um, I guess, you know, if even you want to also answer it, that's also fine. Um, and the question is really about, um, I guess, from an engineer's perspective is how can we use the education of, of female engineers um, and as well as, you know, to try and change the scenario a little bit and, and how do we change um, the men's perception of women, especially, you know, focusing about women in engineering as well. Um, and I guess, you know, in Brazil for Professor Eva and in Australia for, for Ealing. What we are doing now, and it's very interesting, we are inviting young children, uh, uh, 12 or 13 years old, to come to university and to be there. And uh, we try to show them what, what, what we do in engineering, in chemistry, in mathematics, everywhere. Uh, this is something very uh, interesting, and I think it's uh, something that is attracting a lot of new, uh, new women or new adolescents to this kind of career, because we show them that, well, it's open, that's what we do. And so they are very curious and they come there. For example, in uh, we have uh, something in oceanography. Is it correct to say oceanography? Oh, yeah. oceano. Yeah. So, uh, for example, oh, it's interesting how young uh, girls come and go to see what's going on on the ocean, in the ships, and even in uh, uh, engineer for oceans. No. Uh, I would say, I, I think oh. the correct is the Navy engineering, this kind of new work. And it's interesting. So the idea of bringing young children uh, from public schools, almost from public schools to university, that's something we are doing. And I think it's very, very important. Thank you so much, Professor Ava. Um, I guess, Eileen, you know, if you have any comments um, about that question. Uh, maybe I'll just address um, some other questions that were <laughs> directed <laughs> at me, and I just didn't want <clears throat> the questions to go unanswered. Um, 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 so thank you, Professor Eva. I really appreciate your sharing of experience and your uh, 50 years of feminism, that, that kind of uh, tenacity and perseverance and strength is, is really admirable. Um, I hope that um, I, when, I, when I'm at your age, I will still have the, um, uh, the zeal and the passion to continue to do this work. So thank you. Um, really what I um, shared about um, Fire Dragon Feminism um, is, is, is really based on my own location here in Australia. Um, and so I don't, I don't seek uh, to teach anyone how to do feminism because um, feminism is for everyone and it really depends on your own um, you know, context and location. And um, so I'm just really sharing based on how I do it, my methodology and how I find strength and how I find resources. Um, it's not a, a one size fits all and it's also not a, um, a manual for anyone. I'm sure you all have uh, brilliant um, ways of uh, doing feminism. And that's the great thing that we are all doing feminism in different ways uh, to really support different groups of people. Um, so just to clarify that, <clears throat> And um, um, also, the, I think one of the questions is that um, as a fire dragon, I think one question that was um, um, asked is uh, whether, you know, should I always be uh, blowing things down and igniting or killing my enemies? Uh, first of all, it is not meant to be uh, violent. Um, when I say blow flames, I'm really just talking about having that fiery passion to, um, to have that, that um, uh, to, to have the courage to, to expose uh, structures of inequalities is not to really go out and um, you know, uh, kill anyone or injure anyone. It's not meant to be injurious. And when I talk about exposing empirical uh, blind spots, it's about truth-telling. 
right? It's about going back to our histories to, to uh, be honest about what's happening and, and the kind of societies that we've inherited, the structures that we've inherited. Um, so that, that is why my man is not just always incinerating things or just, um, I think one of the things that I learned from one of the um, feminist writer um, is about eloquent rage. How do you express your rage in an eloquent manner that is generative, uh, that is constructive, right? It is not about tearing people down, it is about building, right? So um, when the question was asked about, do you sometimes spread your wings to shelter those who really want to also join your course? Of course, students, that's what we do in class, right? That you, you, um, you know, you, uh, we inspire each other, we learn from each other and we come together to rebuild communities. We come together to, uh, you know, do things together. And, and so those stages that I mentioned, they are not necessarily in uh, sequential chronological order. Um, that you know you have to do step one, step two. That's not as well. We, life is a lot more complicating than we think. Uh, but really, it's, it just served as a kind of um, framework for me to think about how should I navigate, and maybe a, a, a kind of framework to help to to help net, help my students navigate, and that we can work together. Um, so that's that's these are the questions I pick up from from the chat that I wanted to clarify. Um, and one question that was interesting is that as you're doing this work, did the lead, the leaders listen? Uh, are the le leaders listening? Yes and no, right? Of course, uh, we all know that there will be leaders who are your feminist allies who get you and without you having to really um, unpack what feminism is to begin with, uh, to unpack, uh, you know, gender binary to begin with, or to unpack uh, race and racism. Uh, if you have to do a race 101 or gender 101, then you know that it's just going to be too much effort. Um, and of course, there are um, there are leaders who refuse to listen, but um, I can understand why, because they are the power holders. Um, those who have privileges and power, why would you uh, willingly uh, give up, right? So it's not easy to ask uh, people with power and privileges to give up. So often I've met uh, tone deafness, colorblindness and white wall. So yes and no, uh, but I think that we all, uh, you know, pick our battles and be strategic in how we use our resources because they're so precious and they're so finite. These feminist resources are so finite um, and our life is so finite, right? And, and with the pandemic, we know that things are hard to, to uh, say. So to me, it's so precious that I hold on to it and be really careful how I use it and how I recharge and how I carry on. So that's, that's all I want to share. Thank you. Based on the yes. question. Yes, Thanks, thank Emily. you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Eileen and Professor Eva. Um, we are, um, uh, in the interest of time, uh, I would like to move on um, to the closing remarks of the, of the event. Uh, and I thank you so much again, Professor, um, Professor Eva and uh, Dr. Eileen for the wonderful presentations and, and, and the wonderful questions that we also received as well. They were really insightful and it really shows that that, um, that we really care about the future of, of not only just Australia or Brazil, but also beyond that as well. And so um, let me share my screen. Here we are. So uh, just to touch base. So in terms of future events, uh, as I mentioned at the start of the event, um, you know, the Women's Research Engineers Network, it really came to fruition because of our funding support from the Council on Australia Latin America uh, relations. And that funding has come to an end. However, it doesn't mean that uh, rent is over. We are still planning ahead. We do have one more event for uh, at the end of the year, and we have we have Dr. Sheldon Dubowski, who is a senior consultant in higher education development. And she, we will have a workshop. Uh, she'll be presenting the workshop on career and uh, progression as well. Uh, and this workshop is open to um, not just uh, research academics, but also, you know, if you have any students who are doing their, undergoing their postgraduate studies, they are also very welcome to join. Um, we haven't locked in the date yet, I believe, but we will send the save the date out uh, as soon as we can. And uh, the bigger news, I suppose, is the launch of our website. So my team and I have been working really hard to get this up and running for, the, for all of you. Um, and in that slide there, you can see a sneak peek of what the uh, website will look like. It is going to be amazing. 
And it's going to be a really different way for us to connect globally, um, to find out what everyone else is doing around the world and, and, to, and to start collaborating in projects and grants and, and all of that. Uh, and really just, again, you know, making, uh, creating our own opportunities and making our voices heard as well. And with that, as we continue to plan ahead for, uh, for the future, we are calling for an expression of interest. Um, so if you're inter in interested in being part of a proactive women-led team, or you're looking to try something new or different, um, we have picked out four sort of key areas that we're looking for, um, things like website management, marketing communication, media and content creation, or, or even event planning. Um, well, let us know in the survey. So we've popped that question in the survey and that um, you can skip it as well if, if you know maybe next year is not quite the time for you. Um, and, and yeah, definitely looking forward to hear uh, and, and meet people who are really keen to volunteer with us as well. And we'll reach out to you um, as, as we plan something um, bigger for next year. Uh, and with that, I want to thank everyone again for your time. Uh, thank you to the guest speakers, um, Professor uh, Patricia Davidson, Professor Vahan Agopian, um, Dr. Ealing and uh, Professor Ava for your time in, in not only attending, but also preparing for, for today's event as well. Uh, and I, I do think that we took away something really, um, uh, something really great and, and really opened our eyes as well. And definitely, I hope that uh, we take away something that we can then share with our friends and family and, and even our, uh, our colleagues. Um, and thank you to our um, collaborators and um, my, my team for um, the effort and time to make this event possible. Uh, and um, last but not least, you, the attendees, for participating in today's event. And I, again, hope that you were able to take away something, something new as well. Um, yeah, and with that, uh, I will wish everyone a good day or good evening um, and take care as well. Thank you very much. Thank you.